In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Paraclete, Spirit of Truth, you who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of all that is good, master of life, come, dwell within us, cleanse us from all stain, and save our souls, O good one. Mary, cause of our joy, pray for us. Amen. Well, we're going to do the most exciting liturgy of the whole year, the Mass of the Resurrection. It's exciting along with the vigil from the night before, but it's there's a Mass oh, just about always in the tradition, a Mass on Easter morning. Now, some churches wait till the afternoon, and then they read the Gospel from Luke 24. Stay with us, Lord, because it's getting late. <clears throat> uh, but um, I think we do better this way. What I'm going to do first is talk about um, the resurrection and exaltation. One of the words that's used a lot uh, to describe the resurrection is this Greek word, ipsun, to exalt, to raise up. It starts in the first servant song in, in the Septuagint, in Isaiah 53, 12. Behold, my servant, and the word there is exalted, will be exalted, will be... And then you find it many places, this word exalt. For instance, in the hymn in Philippians, and therefore God exalted him and gave him the name it's the same word. So there's an exaltation and not just a resurrection. In fact, in the Gospel of John, there are again three um, passion predictions of a different type than from the synoptics, but they all use this word exalt. And if I be lifted up, if I be exalted, I will draw men to myself, and so forth. You see there, the notion is that Jesus passed not from life to death to life, but from life to death to resurrected life, which is the goal of our whole existence. You know, our citizenship, Paul tells us in Philippians, is in heaven. My passport says heaven. That's where I belong. And from there we await the, the Son of God coming, who is going to conform our bodies to his body, so that forever we will have not only our spirits, but our bodies animated by the life of the Trinity. The joy of that is unimaginable. You have to talk to somebody in heaven. Um, John Paul II in his Theology of the Body, has a beautiful passage, a beautiful chapter where he's talking about this. What happens at that moment when uh, the spirit takes total authority over the body and yields totally to the Holy Spirit so that our bodies become spiritual forever. Forever. Reminds me of this English martyr who was being led up to the guillotine. And he looked up at the sun and said, I'll soon be beyond that fellow. That's faith. You see? So, I want to talk a bit about this resurrection and exaltation. I'm going to use as some guidelines um, a, a text of Thomas Aquinas. This is in the third part, chapter 53 question, rather, 53, is on the resurrection. And uh, I just want to look. He says, whether it was necessary for Christ to rise. And uh, one of the objections, one of the reasons why it might not have been necessary, Christ's passion sufficed for our salvation, since by it we were loosed from guilt and punishment, as is clear 
Consequently, it was not necessary for Christ to rise again from the dead. Now what we, we could look at how Aquinas answers it. What's wrong with that? It's total utilitarian. Jesus is good because he's making me good, fixing me up. What about his own joy? What about his own body being glorious? Is it not just, is it all just to fix me up? The joy that he has, that he has a divinized body that he can share with all the believers who are still on earth, that he can have and partake. Our bodies are conformed to his, as we just heard in Philippians. See, it, 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 it's typical, you know, you could find somebody who would think that way. Uh, but the answer um, is obvious, isn't it? I love Jesus because he's good for me. I love Jesus because he's Jesus. And I'm thrilled that he loves me and I love him. You know, it's like Catherine of Siena. Every time she received the Eucharist, I've told you this before, she would say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. But how long do I have to keep this up in symbol? I want to see you. And of course, the body that we see is the body that still bears the wounds of uh, the cross. Huh? As it says there in uh, the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, there's a lamb standing there, still has the marks of the slaughter. He's proud of those. They are his badge. See what I did for you. And that's why so many of the great mystics, when they have a vision of Jesus, they see light coming from his wounds. Uh, so we're going to reflect just a little bit on that. Huh? Um, so was it necessary for Christ to rise again? Yes. How do I know? Uh, because Luke 24, 46 says it was necessary. Good enough. Scriptures say it. The word in the text is ed, which means it was necessary. But that word, d, I think I've mentioned before, d-e-i, means the Father's will. It's necessary because the Father willed it. That's the way he wants the plan of salvation, in which both the Son and the Spirit, you know, share totally. It was the decision of the Trinity that Jesus rise from the dead. Therefore, it's necessary. Okay, so he fixes that up. He's a good theologian, this fellow Aquinas. Then we have these five reasons, okay? First, the commendation of justice. He suffered. He was humiliated himself. It's only just that he be raised up. He did all that for the Father and for us. So it's just justice that he be exalted, that he have a glorious and wonderful body. Um, and so that's the first reason why it was necessary. The second, for our instruction in the faith. Since our belief in Christ's Godhead is confirmed by his rising from the get dead, because according to 2 Corinthians 13.4, Although he was crucified through weakness, he lives by the power of God. And therefore it is written, If Christ be not risen from the dead, then our preaching is vain, and so your faith is vain. That's the, that's the second reason. Huh? Uh, it, it confirms our belief in his divinity. The third reason, it raises our hope. Through seeing Christ, who is our head, rise again, we hope that we will all likewise rise again. Now, he doesn't quote Philippians. He quotes 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection from the dead? There's got to be. You see? And that's our hope. Just think about that, you know? Uh, We'll die, and we'll thank our bodies, but one day they will rise. Think 
because Jesus died to save human beings, not just souls. Everything that's beautiful about human life, he consecrated. Friendship, marriage. If both the couples make it to heaven, there they are loving each other. There's no more sexual relating, but the relating is beautiful forever. These worldly things, they matter. They matter. They matter to Jesus. We just saw a week or so ago how he wept when Lazarus was dead. Okay. Fourthly, to set in order the lives of the faithful. The power that goes out from that risen body. He quotes Romans 6, 4. Romans 6 is the key to so much of the understanding of our life in Christ. Okay? It's a treatise on baptism. As Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in newness of life. And then further on in Romans 6, which I quoted just a little while ago, Christ rising from the dead dies no more. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And one day, that will be totally, even physically true. And finally, the fifth reason why it was necessary. In order to complete the work of salvation. For just as for this reason he endured the evil things in dying, that he might deliver us from evil, so he was glorified in rising again, in order to advance us toward good things. And he quotes Romans 4.25, which is a classic text. He was delivered up for our sins, handed over for our sins, and rose for our justification. Our justification is linked to his resurrection, not his death. Of course, his death because the resurrection flows from it, but he rose for our justification. Is that glorious, risen, total humanity, the mysterio we were just talking about, that is the source of our life and therefore our resurrection. Okay, now um, I want to talk a little bit um, about the glory of this body and about this mystery. You see, the resurrection is God's final thought about humanity. And that because his son rose from the dead. The word, the Logos incarnate. And that was the divine plan forever. It's hard for us to fathom the depth of the affection that the Trinity has for us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You've just got to meet the Father to know just have to get to know him, meet him, pray for that. It heals all your wounds, or at least renders them innocuous. They're still around, but, you know, because there he is. He's the Principium Dei Tatis. And he is the one coming to us, showing himself as so totally reliable not the shadow of deceit in him. We can trust him totally. That's the fruit of the resurrection. 